So welcome to the second question and answer session of the course. So delighted to have you here with us at STEM Learning in York today. Um, so I've got with me Tanya Shields. Uh, Tanya, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm, as Becca said, Tanya Shields. I'm the primary STEM lead here at the National STEM Centre. And I've also got Chris, who you might recognise from the previous webinar. Hello, I'm uh, Chris Carr. I'm the Network Education Lead at STEM Learning. Um, background is secondary and, and FE mainly. And you've got Becca Knowles, me, hosting the event. Uh, my background is from uh, secondary schools um, and uh, I work here in STEM Learning as well. So we've got some great questions today um, and it's fantastic to have some primary mm. expertise with us because we didn't have that before. Um, so the very first one I was going to talk to you about was Zana and Taryn Lee's questions. They were really about uh, managing the behaviour and language of uh, younger pupils. So I'm going to hand this over to Tanya to have her thoughts on this one. Thank you. I think you've probably got two different issues here. Um, Sana's in a tricky situation in that she's going to school as a spy teacher and trying to manage behaviour in a classroom where she hasn't had the opportunity to build up relationships um, or indeed find out what the school systems are. And I think that's probably the key point here. If you're going into a school and you're wanting to start to set up that standard of behaviour in your classroom, you need to find out what the school systems are um, so that you know what the, the, the protocol is or the systems that the children will process, go through if they are identified as not behaving in an appropriate way. And that gives you the confidence and the assertiveness to be able to manage the class. But it also maintains that consistency so that the children know whichever the class they're in, they have to behave to a certain standard and that the teachers are all fully aware of what that standard is. So with there, it's really consistency from class to class to class and finding out what that system is there. Um, Taryn, I actually think you've done a wonderful job there. It, brilliant set of uh, information that you've given us uh, explaining the different steps and it's it's clear that you've really paid attention to what's gone in the course and implemented uh, all the different strategies that are in there so my advice there really is stick with it behavior is a tricky thing to change it takes time and there are going to be little blips and you are human and the fact that this child is getting under your skin a little bit is, is perfectly natural and you managed this really well. You didn't escalate the situation. The boy knew what the systems were. Fair enough, he didn't move when you asked him to, but actually did then participate in it. He'd almost backed himself into a corner where he re recognised that he could participate in this lesson, but he'd, he'd started off by not complying to the standards that you'd set but he then showed a willingness to participate in the lesson and you were able to praise that and I'm hoping you followed up the conversation with him the following day to to see actually what was going on with that behavior and that was be an ideal opportunity once he's calmed down once you've calmed down to actually praise that good behavior and and hopefully see those changes move through um you also mentioned, is this a good time to implement the or talk through the, the six questions that are on there? Yeah, I think if you're thinking reflectively about your practice and referring to back to what you've learnt within, I think that was in week four, then that that's absolutely what you need to be doing. Revisiting, checking your own practice and thinking about how you can adapt it to meet the, the children's needs within your class. So I think there really, in, in both of those questions, there was, a, there was a, a something similar theme around consistency. Mm. Um, consistency with the school processes in the first question, um, protocols and consistency around your management of an individual in the second one. So that's a really interesting comparison of those. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Tanya. Um, so the second question that we're going to look at is Anika uh, and Rebecca. Um, Rebecca's question got three likes where we're talking about working with adult learners um, who are being rude, talking over and not actually having uh, some respect. Rebecca's particularly is a very interesting question because she works in prison education. Uh, and so we were we were discussing this beforehand and we thought that this, would, this was a great question to answer. So Chris is going to uh, have a go uh, at this time. Okay, so I think this one, it, it is quite challenging and I don't, uh, I don't pretend to have sort of experience of prison education, but I have got experience of secondary and FE where I face similar issues. 
Um, I think for me, it's it's the relationship building that you have with the with the students um, during the course that really makes the difference here. I think it's important for the students to see you as somebody else other than just an authority figure at the front of the room. Um, the way in which you can build relationships, uh, it could be in all sorts of uh, recreational pursuits, um, maybe just uh, informal conversations that you have with them um, beyond the lesson. Um, and in some cases, maybe sort of helping them, showing them some kindness, you know, which, which does get remembered by them. And that, that does gradually start to filter through uh, when you are sort of in front of the class as the, the authority figure. Um, so I think it's really about sort of breaking down that, that perception that they have of you at the start of the class, you know, where, where you are just somebody that's giving out rules and routines and, 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 and trying to discipline them, uh, that they see you as a, as a, as a fellow person. Um, I think that's, that's probably my, my take on that. I think the, the pedagogical slant on it really probably comes in with trying to make the, the lesson content relevant for their particular circumstances. Mm. So if you can maybe put some sort of... Um, a uh, slight sort of uh, angle on the lesson that makes it relevant to them, to their particular circumstances. That's another way in which you can increase engagement with, with your students. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think as well that sometimes the building of relationships with young people, and particularly very challenged young, young people, is... Uh, it takes a bit of time and actually if you build that relationship first and find out about them, find out about their interests, then you've got them on side from mm. the very beginning. I imagine that could be quite challenging with older children as well or yeah. older learners because you've got that historical journey through education mm. where they haven't succeeded and they're bringing an awful lot of baggage to that and trying yeah. to break down those barriers. I imagine that the the, the, the wins that you have are, are small and you have to almost cherish those those tiny small successes and recognise that they're actually a massive change in, in those, those students' yep. behaviours. And I particularly liked Tim's comment to, uh, to Rebecca um, that uh, we had at the, 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 the admiration that he was uh, showing for the challenges that Rebecca was in. So very interesting question. Yeah. I hope we've uh, come some way to think, think about helping in that way. So, our third question uh, got six likes. In fact, it was the most liked question. Um, and this is from Sherry. And uh, she was talking about many disruptive pupils um, in the classroom and how they tag team or when one stops uh, misbehaving, another one starts misbehaving, uh, essentially um, trying to go to some... Uh, uh, reaction out of out of the teacher. Um, I mean, I had this experience quite often in secondary school, uh, and I think that really you have to um, be able to anticipate that this is going to happen with that class and put in place structures beforehand and ensure that you're really um, quite firm with those young people in terms of uh, the expectations. So it is sometimes a good idea to bring them all into the classroom, sit them down and say, right, uh, I'm not very happy with the way in which the class is behaving. We're going to have a new plan for how we're going to behave. And you, you uh, place students strategically around the room and quite carefully with those disruptive pupils put them out of the eye line of other disruptive pupils because actually if they can actually see the other disruptive pupils they will um, rise to their, their their bait of them and so actually if you can try if you can arrange the class so they, they're not in the same eye line as those pupils it can actually help you to manage them because they can't they can't see each other and don't be uh, so. Don't be um, changing the plan or your lesson plan for at least three or four weeks. So make sure that you are very consistent. Uh, you praise good behaviour. You follow up poor behaviour. Um, and I would take them as an individual. So if you're following up poor behaviour, don't take the foot poor behaviour of the multiple disruptants. Take them one at a time and talk to them individually and try and build a relationship with each one individually. And that way you usually will be able to uh, break down that barrier with them. I don't know if anybody else has got a comment. Yeah, I think I mean, for me as well, it's, it's, it's about the, the structure of the lesson, the pace of the lesson. I think if you, if you have a sort of very well-paced lesson with, with short little activities with a defined time limit and you're clear about what the task is, 
then it, it almost doesn't give enough yeah. room really for the disruption to start happening. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that when you are dealing with, with any sort of um, off-task behaviour, it needs to be short, sharp and sweet as to how you deal with it. Um, I think if you start getting um, embroiled in, a, in some sort of dispute, then your head goes down into that, that small group of students and you lose the perspective of what's going on around the rest of the class. And that's when other students can start to, to act up. Um, so I think it's about really sort of keeping that, that situational awareness and letting the whole class know that you are still monitoring the whole class and you're aware of what the whole class is doing and deal with any sort of little disputes um, very quickly. Good, good advice there. Um, I think in the primary classroom you've got uh, a slightly different slant in that you've got that class for the whole day and um, for the whole week and I know a strategy that worked with one of my more challenging classes was to to reward the class when they'd all been they'd, they'd done some or the, the behavior in that class had been good for the day or good for a lesson and again choosing the steps according to the standard of um, the behavior in the classroom and we used to have uh, and it was it was a year three class so seven year old seven eight year olds we used to have sammy superstars so we had the head of a snake on a display board and then they all got little segments um, if they individually did something that was good but as a class I used to give out foiled segments which said the whole class had behaved brilliantly for a whole lesson or a whole day or a whole week and we built it and the snake path took a path all along the ceiling and the challenge was to get the snake out of the, the classroom door because we've got that in the primary classroom we've got that that almost family feel of we are working together to be the best class in the school to to actually improve our behavior and to show everybody that we are the best class in the school and look everybody that walks in can see this reward um and the parents really enjoyed it, or the children really enjoyed showing their parents. You'd see them on parents' evenings coming in, walking in, almost walking into tables and things because they were looking up to see what was actually on the ceilings. Um, so that's just just a way that we managed rewarding that good behaviour and getting them to work together as a class. Moving on to the next question, we were, we were concerned and felt we needed to really um, give... Uh, support to Neil Dett. Uh, she's obviously uh, lacking confidence with her classes um, and feels quite miserable about it, I think, when they are um, noisy and don't respect her. Um, so I was we were thinking about some of the questions, the strategies from the course that we could uh, give Neil Dett. And uh, I think from my own point of view, it's uh, it takes time, is what I would say, is that it, it can't be fixed in one easy activity. And so actually building your confidence and ensuring that you uh, are, are happy with the quick wins that you get out of the, the class, then that will help you to feel even more confident in that situation. Um, Tanya, I don't know if you had any advice for Neil Dett. Um, I, I mean, this one, it, it strikes a chord really with me because when I first started teaching, I had an observation which wasn't particularly great um, and somebody from outside the school was making a judgment on my teaching. The thing that got me through was a, a head teacher. The head teacher of the school was incredibly supportive and recognised the things that I was doing well. So finding somebody in your school that can help you identify what's going well and draw attention to that is going to build your confidence. The problem you have at the moment is bringing about change when you're not feeling particularly good about yourself is incredibly challenging. So keep going back over what you've learned in the course, making sure you have that consistency and maybe think about building those relationships with the, the children in your class, the, the learners in your class um, and making them see you not just as this person who may, might not have the experience of other teachers in the school, but somebody that they can relate to and that they can learn from. This builds really on the answer that Chris gave in the previous question about building relationships with your students and finding that way in with them. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, one of the best bits of advice that I was ever given um, when I was first starting out was that everybody that comes into your lesson and observes you, every single one of those people, including Ofsted inspectors, will have taught a bum lesson in their time. Um, so it's worth remembering that you're not alone. Okay, this does sort of happen. Um, just to give you a bit of practical advice, you, you mentioned at the bottom of your answer that the students are so noisy that, that they don't respect you. Um, one bit of practical advice is that you, you never talk over the top of your students. If they're not listening, then you just stop. Okay, um, and you, you you demand the silence. And if they're not being silenced, then there is a consequence as a result of that. I think you have to repeat that 
many, many times sometimes, but eventually the respect will come. They'll know what you will tolerate and what you won't tolerate. Um, and it's about sort of setting the standards out at the start of the lesson, really, about what you expect. I think that's a really good uh, point there, Chris. And one of the ways in which I used to do that with particularly disruptive uh, classes was have a stop clock. Uh, and every time I was waiting for them to um, answer or be quiet and so I could talk to them, I'd start the stop clock, I wouldn't tell them, and then I'd stop the stop clock when they were silent. And so um, I could then tell them at the end of the lesson how much time that they'd wasted um, by talking. Um, and then the consequence would be that they would give that time back or, or um, some of the time back at some point in the future, or they'd have to work it off uh, by being silent. Uh, later on. So that's just another practical strategy as well. So thanks for those um, answers, some really useful ones. And, and, and we do hope that uh, you build your confidence and uh, begin to really uh, command the uh, classroom as you, as you wish to. Um, so we're going to move on to another one uh, that we have sometimes had a, a, quite a lot of questions about. We've got Anna Lara and uh, Eleanor who were really wanting to talk about the role that parents have in um, supporting and developing behaviour management of, of the classroom. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, I always think is that, for me, um, it was always seemed very ironic that you'd you know if the child was behaving badly you'd speak to the parents and and it was always in very negative uh situation uh and so one of the ways i instituted was i'd pick um two or three at the end of each week um that i'd ring the parents of and say how fantastic they'd been in the lesson now obviously the young people talk to each other and so the next lesson quite often some of the other students would come around and say well why didn't you give mine Mum a ring. I want. I wanted to have a, a phone call home, well, I, and and I would then say, well, it might be your turn this week. It depends on how you behave this week. And so they like to have that positive um, feedback. And I think that we as teachers very often just go straight for the negative. However, I would say that you know if a, a pupil who is um, n not succeeding or attaining because of their um, behaviour. I think that the parent needs to know that, and, and it's not talking about the the student in a negative way. It's talking about how it affects their learning, and, the, uh, and I think that if you depersonalise it so that it's about um, they're not learning as well as they could be, rather than they're behaving poorly, that sometimes um, can sometimes uh, get over that barrier of defensiveness against the parents. Uh, um, against the school because sometimes they might have a negative response to that. I don't know if you've got anything to add. No, not really. I think um, I think you've covered most of the, the, the main points there, really. Um, I think um, I think really it's just a, a case of establishing the fact that you've got your rules in the classroom. Um, and, you know, regardless of what the circumstances might be at home, and it will be very varied circumstances, that, that when they come in through the door of your lesson, that this is now mm. the learning environment and these rules now apply. Um, and it might be worth just sort of you know, you're pointing out the fact that everybody behaves different in different situations. The, the way I behave when I'm down the pub is very different to how I behave at work, um, and that applies to anybody. Uh, so worth probably just just pointing that out to your students. I was just thinking about the 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 role that you said when you ring home and you get that positive those positive ripples happening. And I think with social media that's that's even more so because you see parents posting things on Facebook when their children have got worker of the week and number of likes and it's not just their family. And I think sometimes we maybe need to help our our families at home develop a relationship with us. So when a child goes home after having a bad day, that that their behaviour isn't um, isn't consolidated by the parents agreeing with them. The parents are actually on our side mm. because they've got that relationship that yeah. knows that we're trying to do our best because we do let them know when the children are doing something good. Mm. So that that we have we have this this holistic um, view to education where we're all involved and we all know what's acceptable and we all re are recognised when we do something that's that's good or, or or improved. So I think social media really it has. It, that has a positive impact as well, and it's and it's nice to share the good stuff. Yeah, great. So we're moving on to a couple of questions that we had left over from the last uh, question and answer session. We really wanted to get uh, 
uh, Tanya's expertise uh, of the primary um, aspect of this. And we've got one from uh, Anastasia and Sally, who are really talking about um, how to manage the behaviour of quite young children. Um, and we're talking about those in the three to five year old age bracket, both of those. So I was wondering if you could give us some advice for, on that area. It's, yeah, this is something that I'm having to deal with at the moment with a, uh, a two year old, which is what is acceptable behaviour. And um, it's the same, the message is the same where wherever we whatever we're doing within the classroom that when the children come through the door you have a set of rules and those are the rules which the children follow regardless of their age. Now the rules are going to be slightly different and the parameters might be slightly different. So the example that we were speaking about earlier was um, so if you've, you've got a child that's playing with a piece of equipment with a ruler or a pencil um, We'll have all experienced that time when a child accidentally, and I do believe it is accidental, accidentally flicks something across the table, which isn't acceptable behaviour. But if it was accidental, then we can we can permit that. If we don't ignore it, sorry, we can permit it, but we don't ignore it. So we would draw attention to it and say, just be careful when you're using that piece of equipment. Please don't throw it across the classroom because it could hurt somebody and, and so on. If the child then goes on to repeat that same action, then that is the reprimandable behaviour. That is the behaviour that is not acceptable that we have to deal with. So I, I would hope that if we have that relationship with children, we can identify which behaviour is genuinely breaking the rules and that which is accidental. When working with young children, we are going to have tantrums. We are going to have that difficulty with dealing with their behaviour. Um, thinking this was with a slightly older child, but the, the maturity was uh, of, of an issue here, that this child was in trouble and basically he'd got so frustrated with the situation, couldn't verbalise it, and I couldn't communicate with him because he was so upset. He was sat, he was he was crying. You could see his face was red and it was just, there, there was no communicating with him. At that point, it was a case of saying, right, you need to take some time to calm down. So I'm going to give you that time whilst I carry on teaching somebody else. Um, the, the issue you have there with the, the parents not being approachable um, possibly links with the, the conversation that we've just had about recognizing positive behavior you've got some work to do there if if you want to build that relationship with the mother then you recognize that that good behavior and you reward that child so one the mother sees that their child is doing well and doesn't believe that you've got it in for their child um, and then the child is that's been reinforced at home as well so it, it's trying to find those little gems jumping on them, acknowledging them and, and building on those relationships there. Um, but any except you set, you set the rules in your classroom and regardless of age, those children must uh, adhere to those those rules. And it's quite interesting. I mean, I think that, you know, neither Chris nor I have got any experience of, uh, other than having our own children, of dealing with very young children in a classroom mm -hmm. situation. But it, it, it seems so the, the same sort of methodology as you do with a much older yeah. child. And w this leads us on to uh, uh, our next question, which is from Tim, about talking about different strategies for different age groups. And also Ruth has well talked about working with teenagers aged from 12 to 15 and also saying, there is there some different strategies um, that you use? with those I think from my own perspective as a secondary school teacher working with that, that age group of 12 to 15 I think that the same strategies are actually very positive but the the teenagers um, are less likely to be overtly uh, happy about various mm. things particularly positive uh, phone calls or positive cards uh, that, you, that you give to them. I think as they move into a, a, an even older age group, uh, uh, 16, 17, 18, they come back to being um, more uh, appreciative of positive uh, engagement. But because teachers have got out of the habit of doing it, that they get less of that positive inf influences. Um, so I, I remember when I had a, a, an A-level chemistry class of 16 uh, and 18 year, 16 to 18 year olds, uh, and they saw um, positive cards 
on the board, on the wall for my year nine class, my 13 year olds, um, with stickers on. And they all wanted to have one. So we had to have a separate wall with the six form um, names and they could have their sticker board. And they were quite happy about that. And when my year 11 classes, my 16, 17 year olds came in, they thought it was quite strange that the six formers, the 18 year olds liked these these stickers. But I think that it's they do enjoy that praise and reward uh, as long as you mean it and it's not just um, handed out willy-nilly or handed out to the pupil um, in a meaningless way so a, a child who is more disruptive is quiet for 30 seconds and then gets a reward whereas a child who's less disruptive has to be quiet has to sit quietly and work for five minutes and gets the reward you've got to, there's got to be equity around that uh, and I think that all children notice a lack of equity in there. Um, don't you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, the, the point I was going to raise really was, was the same point you just sort of made at the end there, really, was the fact that how important it is that your, your praise is genuine. Um, and it's nice sometimes, if you, if you really know your class and you know your students, you know what the personal angle is that you could take on your praise. And it doesn't have to be... Um, Sort of cards or, or, or anything else. It can just be a verbal comment, you know, just just whispered in their ear um, as you walk around the class. Um, as long as it is heartfelt and it's meant, um, then I think they that they take that and they they respond to it. I was thinking the the point about having the, that drive by management of behaviour in the classroom, where you drive by to try and to um, calm a situation that might be developing. You maybe do you drive by compliments as well, which are that that quiet whisper mm. to a child, which isn't embarrassing in front in, in front of their peers it, but it is an, a genuine acknowledgement of do you know that that piece of work is really good or I really appreciate the fact that you came into class and started working straight away mm-hmm. so that the child knows that that they're being valued and that their good behavior has been acknowledged but yeah. it's not being drawn to the attention of the whole of the class and I think as you know your classes you know those young people mm. that like to have that overt yeah. praise and you know those pupils that would feel humiliated or, or, or looked at and that can be quite sensitive for teenagers so you've just got to it's about knowing your pupils mm-hmm. really I think in all situations mm-hmm. yeah Final question for this question and answer session is uh, from Andy and Eduardo, who really were talking about uh, an interesting aspect and talking about um, the human rights of the individuals within the classes um, and thinking about how those rights should be balanced for the students and the the pupils. Um, I, you know. We've all been in that situation where um, young people say, it's, this is against my human rights. Uh, and actually, I think that it's, it's quite a, an interesting point that they raise. Um, so how can we sort of have the right approach to this type of element within the classroom? Um, Tanya, I don't know if you uh, have got any thoughts on this. Yeah, it's this is one of the, it, it could be a little bit of a trigger for me, this one, like, like um, red rag to a bull. Um, when a child turns around to me and says, you cannot do that, it's, it's, it, it's quite confrontational there. Um, if you have a set of class rules and the class have agreed to that and we know what acceptable behaviour is, if you're sticking to those, to those rules in the classroom and the child's accusation of it's against my human rights um, is unjust, then really we need to, to question the child about that. Is this a... a why are their human rights are in conflict or try and try and understand why they feel so aggrieved um, and explain to them that actually this is what we've agreed in our classroom this is what we said would happen and this isn't in conflict with your human rights and we're doing this so that everybody has the opportunity to learn and that you have the opportunity to learn um, it's it it's confrontational. It's the 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 student, the child, is it intending to get a response from you there? And I think really the key is to to in as probably I didn't do as well in the past is to to remain calm and actually deal with it in a in a controlled manner where it's calm and um, we can actually talk and agree how we should be behaving in the classroom. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Chris, have you got anything to add there? I think to me it goes back to the the learning environment again. Um, The the fact that the students are part of a a learning community, uh, that there are certain rules that apply, which are the rules of the the school or the college. 
And these have been agreed on. Um, and in, in many cases, the parents will have, have signed to say they agree with this. Uh, so really that, I, I would probably just sort of nip that in the in the bud really, um, as soon as it's raised, um, just sort of briefly explain that to them. Um, and if they've got an issue with it, then be delighted for their parents to come in and discuss further. <laughs> A great response there. So we've had some really interesting and different questions. Thanks for so much for all of those, um, particularly this last one, uh, uh, you know, and also the one about prison education. Really enjoyed considering that a, a different way. So really enjoyed working with you again. If you have got uh, any more questions, put them up on the website and we'll see if we can answer them. Um, and um, it's been great having another webinar. So thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.